new here. Let me share my screen. And, uh, and if you can see from my screen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go off a little bit of normal, normalcy and normal script where people show slides and demos. I'll, I'll show some demos, but um, I also really like, you know, I, I can't, nobody's traveling right now, right? And uh, as part of my work as, a, as an architect and, and working with, with customers, I, I really enjoy traveling and, and being in front of them and um, you know, talking about solutions and uh, sketching things on, on whiteboards and going back and having that collaborative uh, feel. And that's not something that, that we've been able to, to do. Um, and uh, so one of the formats that I wanted to try for, for at least this, this meetup is, uh, is trying to go back to that drawing board feel and um, sketch concepts as they pop into my head down onto paper or in this case, an iPad. And, uh, and and try to explain uh, explain and um, and illustrate some of the the concepts that come up when people discuss deploying Istio, especially across multiple clusters. Um, we're gonna we are gonna take a look at, a little bit at what we're uh, what what I've been working on and and uh, folks here at Sullivan working on in terms of WebAssembly, and uh, and just try to share some some of the stuff and happy to make it interactive, right? Like I, like I said earlier, the best part was being with people and, uh, and exchanging ideas and, and trying to draw them out. You know, I, I would prefer this to be two-way street so people jump in and ask questions or clarifications or objections and pushback if, uh, if, uh, you, know, if, you, if you see an opportunity for that. So um, with that, thank you for joining the community meeting and uh, Cross your fingers. Let's hope the iPad and the and everything uh, cooperates here, and, uh, and let's let's get going. Uh, okay. So the first thing we I, I wanted to talk about is uh, is Istio deploying Istio into into multiple clusters. That is a use case that um, we here at at Solo work very closely with organizations, some extremely large organizations with hundreds, if not more, clusters, and some of the folks who are just getting started, who might have a single cluster, uh, and maybe going into a handful of uh, of those Istio clusters, and uh, and anything in between. Uh, and I'm going to focus on a couple of problems. Uh, you know, this this discussion could go on for days. Uh, but I'm going to focus on a couple of problems specifically around what is, what is the model for um, how you manage these clusters, how you update the config, what that configuration looks like, uh, some of the complexities that uh, arise in, that, in those scenarios, what are some of the models. Um, and then we'll get to uh, what we'll switch gears completely and use some of, some of the models that we describe and see how that fits in with uh, deploying and managing uh, extensions to the mesh based on WebAssembly. So WebAssembly is, uh, is, is something fairly new that just hit upstream Envoy. And although it has, has been around in various dimensions and flavors in the Istio proxy for a little bit, uh, especially around customization of metrics and so on. Uh, but we can, you know, we're, we're on the cusp of, uh, of being able to use WebAssembly for um, a growing set of use cases to extend the capability of the mesh. And, uh, and in fact, at least here at, at Solo, we are working with some large co customers that are putting WebAssembly into production right now, which a month or two ago, I, I would have thought that'd be scary, but uh, it's, working out, it's working out really good. So um, let's, let's see if I can switch into uh, one, one of these diagrams and let, let's start from the beginning, right? So if you go to the istio.io website and look at the documentation, there's a few different flavors for running Istio across multiple clusters. There is the, the model where everything is on the same network, which if you have and can enjoy a situation like that, then by all means go for it. And what that means is you might run multiple clusters with non-conflicting networks or, or rather routable networks between each of the pods so that the, the 
you know, pod, a pod in cluster one talking to a pod in cluster two doesn't have to do anything special. Just talk to the IP of that pod or that Kubernetes service and everything will be routable and everything will be fine. Another model is the, uh, is where the clusters are in separate networks. <clears throat> and in that model, the, the, the workloads, they communicate with each other by first going through an ingress gateway, right? So to get to that other network, they, when they, when they talk to another service under the covers, they get routed through to the ingress gateway and then that ingress gateway would pass the traffic through. Now, how does, how does this service here know that when it talks to a, a service B, that service B actually lives over on a different cluster? Well, Istio has something called the service entry, right? And that's, we, we, we put that config uh, piece of config here and we give it a name of, of B, let's say there's a service B. And then when this particular proxy wants to talk to a service B under the covers, you know, it, using Istio's redirection mechanisms, we're able to, um, we're, we're able to force the traffic to go to the ingress gateway that lives in, in the second cluster. Um, so now this, this model will happen um, when you're on different networks and you need to hop to different networks. Now there's another variant to the multi-cluster model, which is sharing or not sharing a control plane. Uh, in, this, in this case that we see here, we have two different clusters with two different Istio control planes. And the reason that I, I, we, we typically start out with this model is that it allows for various types of failure and isolation. So if this cluster goes down, we're not trying to share a control plane and this, that cluster can go down and not affect the, the other cluster. Um, okay, so then if we have separate control planes, then we need some way of telling the work, tell, telling the, the, the control plane in cluster one, we'll call this one cluster one and this one cluster two, that, hey, this is service, this is service A, service A talks to service B, but that service B also lives over here on, uh, on, on cluster two. And the, the routing that happens between service A and B over here, if this service were to fail, we need some way for, for the service A pod to know that service B also exists over here and that to go through the ingress gateway. Now, I, I pointed out earlier that we can do that with service entries. Uh, basically, it's an entry into Istio's uh, 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 registry, service discovery registry that says, okay, well, service B is over here also. In 1.8, and although this, this capability had existed before, but it was officially documented in, uh, in 1.8, the model that uh, it, it, the, the docs suggest is to um, connect, connect cluster one to cluster two, it, to, to its Kubernetes API, right? So we have the Kubernetes API here, and we also have a, uh, you know, the, the Kubernetes API in cluster one. And what, what the doc suggests is create a little, a little secret here on cluster one that knows how to authenticate to cluster two, do the same thing on cluster two back to cluster one and have them pull the, the endpoints for all the different services. And so if there are endpoints for service B over on, on cluster two and on, on cluster one, then Istio will know about that there's a service B on cluster two, right? And in this model, we don't have to create all of the different service entries and, and so on. Now, one of, the, one of the challenges or uh, unfortunate side effects of this, is, as, as we've seen with uh, some of the folks who, who've adopted this model, is that it, the, the more clusters you have, let's, let's draw a couple more here, the more 
and 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 you want to sh federate the services across these different uh, clusters the more you have to create these security tokens to talk to the kubernetes api in the various clusters right so every cluster ends up having access to the Kubernetes API of any of the other clusters in that, that group, right? If, if we're gonna to try to discover the services across those, those clusters. And what, we've, what we found is that uh, operations folks, platform folks don't like having those secrets spread around to every single cluster and that every single cluster has access to every single other cluster, at least in terms of, of, of its API. Um, and so if we, if we accept that, then we have to say, okay, so what, what is, what is a different model? How, how, how can we, uh, if, if we're going to solve the problem of service discovery, which, which we need to do, um, and we don't want to share these secrets and shuffle them around because you could have a hundred clusters and, uh, that, and if one cluster gets compromised, then all of them potentially could get compromised. Uh, it's not a very, it's not a very safe model. Uh, one of the, one of the options that we've been working with, uh, with customers around is, um, let's see if I can go to, let's just go to this, this diagram, um, is going back actually to the, the model of, of placing the service entries where they should, where, where they should go. And this has a couple of uh, advantages. One instead of giving every cluster access to every other cluster, you could have something else. Some, let's, let's, let's call this a, a config, config automator or whatever. Uh, and this, this config automation can say, all right, cluster one and cluster two, for the services that, uh, that need to talk with each other, we will put service entries onto those Cluster, on, onto those clusters. And for the ones that don't need to talk, we won't, we won't add the services. So we won't tell every, we won't tell all of the clusters about all of the services, only the ones that need to talk with each other. So we have a little bit more fidelity when it comes to actually uh, uh, paring down the amount of config that gets shared. Um, the second thing is now, instead of all the clusters knowing about all the other ones, uh, what we can have is, is a model where, where now only one, the config automator ne needs to know about how to access and push config to the various clusters. All right, so now we kind of go, go back and we're gonna, we're gonna have a little bit more control over what gets exposed and how it gets exposed. And we're gonna scope down the security um, surface or, or potential threat surface down to let's say a single uh, service, the, the, the config automator or orchestrator piece. Now, even that <laughs> has its own uh, drawbacks because there are, uh, there's definitely large organizations where, uh, as I mentioned, they might get into the thousands of clusters. Um, and so looking at it from a scalability standpoint, as well as from a security standpoint, now we have one single component that has access to everything. Um, and so that, you know, that, that model may or, this model may or may not work for, uh, for some folks. And, uh, you know, we, we, we have, we have, uh, we're, we're working with people where it does work for them and we have people that doesn't work for them. And for those folks where it doesn't work, instead of one single component, knowing about, uh, knowing about everything and being able to communicate and talk with everything. What we've, what we've seen work is uh, uh, the, the opposite. So instead of pushing these configs or you know, pushing the uh, demanding security, um, you know, being able to talk to all these different clusters from a single uh, spot, what, we, what we've said is, why don't we push it? Why don't we have the clusters, oops, wrong pen. Why don't we have the, the clusters actually connect up to the management plan or, or some control uh, config control aut automation and say, hey, I'm cluster whatever. Why don't you give me the config that, that, that I need? Uh, and so in this way, we have a much more decentralized and pull based model where a, a, a single component doesn't have um, 
you know, access to everything. And the, uh, the security boundaries have then put, been pushed out to an, an individual uh, cluster so that if you get access to any one of them, you don't have access to everything. Uh, so let me let me stop and just see, first of all, whether that, that, that makes sense to, to folks and see what, whether this is a problem for any of those folks running multiple clusters that they have run into and maybe how they've dealt, dealt with it differently. I'll just open it up for a sec. Hey, Christian, this is Lynn. I, I think it's really interesting you are describing this problem. Uh, certainly, there are some challenges I've also heard that um, there are concerns to allow even just read access just to re, uh, allow the primary cluster to allow access to the remote cluster just on the read access for the API server. So mm -hmm. I've also heard uh, similar concerns on that. I, I think it's interesting how you guys uh, tackle this problem. Uh, I'm curious how you secure the, the connection and uh, the push from individual cluster to the configuration automation um, yeah. component. Definitely, yeah. So, so far, I'm just trying to talk about the, the problem generally. Um, and then I'll go into a little bit of, uh, of how we're working with, with, with folks to, to solve this problem. Um, but yeah, just, just, just first wanted to kind of lay the groundwork of what, what's available, what, what are some of the patterns, uh, what, what are some of the drawbacks and, and talk about it like that. But then, yeah, I, I'm, I'd love to go into some of the stuff that we're, we're specifically doing. Okay, great. But by the way, I really like this presentation style. It's yeah, like that was so gonna be my next real. question. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's very cool. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Any anyone else have uh, have, have thoughts or questions or, or acknowledgement that they're following along? This makes sense. Yeah, Vicente here from Zendesk Technology. It's uh, a task that we have on our backlog to build. We've been calling this internally a remote service reconciler which was mm -hmm. your previous slide. That was the idea we had in mind without digging further. But yeah, I really appreciate you sharing your thoughts and looks like uh, we're gonna need to revisit and, and reconsider that architecture that we planned. <laughs> yeah, sure, happy to, uh, happy to share. Yeah, okay, so that, that is a great segue to uh, another part of the, the problem, which I alluded to, but uh, can go into just, just slightly a little bit more which is the configuration problem, right? Um, one, of the, one of the things I guess more just as anecdotally, what, what we see in some of the, the, the big uh, outages that make headlines and so on, and even in your own organizations, this may be uh, true as well, certainly has been in my past where um, changes to the system typically consists of uh, more than just application code changes, right? There's uh, the, the more stuff we push into the infrastructure, the more, thi more things we lean on with configuration, uh, you know, config, shuffling around configs, getting the configs right and so on. Configuration ends up being a gigantic reason why things fail or, or, uh, or take outages. Um, and, and so another part of this problem is how do you, it, it, it's not just, it's not good enough just to say, like, so for example, in Istio, if I need to configure a service in one cluster, I'm typically touching things like the virtual service, destination rules, sometimes a sidecar resource. Um, and when I'm doing that across lots of different clusters, if they're all heterogeneous clusters, maybe the problem isn't as bad, but still we have to push the, those configs, identical configs out to the different clusters. Um, but if they're not, uh, you know, if, if, they're, if they're different clusters, if they are heterogeneous uh, uh, clusters, then, then the configs slightly change, right? And the direction of traffic is sort of implied in the configuration. And some, somehow that needs to be accounted for. Now, if you take this and, and spread it out to, um, let's say a whole, a whole bunch of different clusters, 
now we have to shuffle these configs, make sure the implicit directionality and all of the, all of the other stuff is, is taken care of. Uh, that's even if you had all of this put into your GitOps pipeline, there's, there's still a lot of moving pieces here. Uh, and uh, let, me, let me just switch back to the, this one. This is the one I wanted to be on anyway. Um, there's still a lot of moving pieces here and a lot of ways that, that things can go, go wrong. So uh, what we've been working with uh, with folks on is how can we how can we simplify this a little bit and abstract this away a little bit um, so that the the model that you use as a as a as a user right is is a, a little bit more simplified and focused on what it is that you're trying to do with the platform as a whole whether it's a or or whatever right you you your trying to orchestrate a release or you're trying to introduce maybe you have like maybe you have a bunch of different clusters running your application work workloads and you have a separate cluster where you introduce canary releases all right and in that separate cluster you want to get some traffic that's flowing in the rest of the system over to this this separate cluster this, this new canary cluster all right uh, what you care about is doing the release, making sure the canary works. You don't care where, you know, that the fact that there's a, there's a canary cluster or, or more canary clusters or the, the whole physical topology deployment isn't what concerns you as, at least as a, as a developer. Like, I just want to release my service. I want to make sure that it's up. I want to make sure that if things start to fail, they fail gracefully. That, uh, you know, in, in certain cases, you take locality into, um, um, uh, into account and so on. That, but, but the actual, whether there's virtual services on this cluster that match and service entries and so on, you focus on the, the, the part that matters to, to you, All right? And then that, that, that comes back to this, um, to this concept of the, you know, something that can manage that configuration, uh, something that can manage actually configuring clusters the, the correct way with the right virtual services, with the right direction that everything needs to be configured in, um, but but simplifying the model that the end user has to has to worry about. Um, and so, I, I guess without um, more drawing and stuff, why, why don't I get into the uh, you know what what we've been working on or what we've been doing and how that fits with with this problem. And then we'll extend that. We'll take a little bit of a shift and we'll extend this same problem and apply it to how we, uh, how we manage uh, customizations to the data plane, customizations to the, the service mesh itself. All right, so let's, let me move this thing out of the way. Um, so what I'm gonna show you real quick is, uh, so we, we, have a, we have a system uh, let's see if I can bring this thing back over. That that look, the architecture looks like this. All right, we have a, we have a few different clusters, and we have some piece that is smart enough about the configuration, um, and and can automate that configuration, and has a, 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 a an API that users can can use to to influence the the different configs that that end up getting sent down to these clusters. So if we just look real quick at the demo, we have two different clusters in this case, running on GKE, cluster one, cluster two. They run some parts of the book info demo from Istio. You can see product page and details and reviews v1 and v2. In the second cluster, we see reviews v1, v2, and v3. So you can kind of think of uh, cluster two maybe as our canary cluster where we introduce a new version of reviews and we want to, <clears throat> from, from the rest of the traffic in the fleet, we, we might want a percentage of that to come to this canary cluster. And uh, you know, if, th if things fail at that cluster, then what, you know, whatever, we'll, we'll blow it away. So the first thing that, uh, that we wanna take a look at is the app and make sure that it's working. Full host, 9080. Move to the product page, cross fingers. All right. So the normal working app that we have running, this happens to be in cluster one, but, but the reviews V1 and V2 are in cluster one and cluster two. 
Uh, we refresh, we see it, re re reviews v1 and v2, that's, that's all normal. Um, but what we wanna do is we want to, we wanna release uh, reviews v3, and we wanna do that in a canary fashion. Uh, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna use a, uh, an, an API, a little bit more simplified API, but it does take into account the fact that there are multiple clusters. Now you can be very explicit and actually name the clusters, or you can completely leave that out and it'll apply to all of the services across you know, a fleet of clusters. But in this case, we do wanna be explicit and say, well, uh, route, in this case, I'm gonna choose a large number so we don't have to wait, keep refreshing, but uh, I'm gonna route actually 75% of the traffic to any of the traffic coming into the review service to, uh, to the canary that would be running in cluster two. And this traffic policy resource, so this is the API that, that we came up with that uh, it actually, I was, I was about to say it suits most people, but it actually doesn't. <laughs> there's no one API that suits most people or everyone. And, uh, and, and there's, there's some reason behind this. Um, this API is actually customizable. You can change the shape of this API depending on who needs to use it. I'll talk about that later. But um, so anyway, we have we have this traffic policy API that is a little bit more focused on who are the what is the source of the traffic, what is the destination of the traffic, and what is the rule that needs to apply to that traffic. Um, so it's a little bit higher, a little bit more abstract on, on top of the SEO API, uh, but we can still do traffic shifting and and that kind of thing. So let's apply this to our config automation, or we we call it management server management plane. Uh, and then when we come over here and cross our fingers, we refresh, we should see some traffic go to the red stars, which would be reviews V3. So it is going across from, from cluster one to cluster two because of this, this automation or because of the, this configuration. The automation under the covers. So if I take a look at our policies, we see our, our policy here. We've routed 75% of the traffic to a different cluster. That's all good, but under the covers, if we look at one of the, the, the service meshes, we see the correct virtual services, the correct service entries, destination rules, any of the envoy filters that we need to, uh, need to use here, uh, gateways and, and any of those things have automatically been created and put on the right cluster uh, where that, that particular mesh lives. So if we happen to look at uh, virtual service here, this is the Istio virtual service. Uh, we see indeed that uh, you know, the, the direction of traffic is, is set uh, correctly. Uh, so that's, that's an example. Uh, we're using a, a tool called Glue Mesh, which is an open source project and, uh, and specifically targeting the, this problem and, and, and more things, but this problem that we described here. And this can also be used to extend the capabilities of the mesh. So let me show you what that, what, what I mean by that. So I, it's, I, don't, I don't have time. And this is, a, again, another, another thing that we can talk about in, in detail or have it be its own session. But uh, you, if you've been watching Istio and Envoy and some of the stuff that's been happening around it with WebAssembly, you, you would kind of understand that WebAssembly can be used to customize the behavior of the proxy. And you can pick the language that you like for WebAssembly and, and write, the, write the functionality in that language for the, you know, there's limitations, it's still emerging. Um, but um, you know, that, that, is, that is a way to customize the, the proxy. Now the question is, how do you actually deploy that? I mean, it's nice in a demo to be able to just put it into a, uh, a uh, uh, on the file system and hack the config to load it off the file system and so on, but across multiple nodes, Across multiple meshes, how how do you manage? Or how do you deploy WebAssembly? Um, so I guess the first thing that we want to do is before we uh, deploy it is actually build a new WebAssembly module. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna use some some tooling that we have, but you can you can use any tooling to build your WebAssembly module. Uh, I'm gonna choose uh, assembly script. We'll target Istio 1.8. And that will 
basically bootstrap for us a, a project that has all of the right uh, all of the right versions uh, for the right <clears throat> excuse me the, <clears throat> for the SDK that you might want to uh, use for uh, for writing your your WebAssembly module, and it it, it spits out a sample um, sample source code that you can go in and start start editing. Uh, in this case, we're going to edit the uh, the headers on a response, and we'll change we'll add a header hello world that part you know that that, that part is its own again its own topic but. Um, Let's try to build it. There's a chance that do I have Docker running? Let's find out. I actually didn't run through this. It was a bit off the cuff. Um, but what, what we're going to do here is we're going to build our WebAssembly module as an OCI image. And then from there, we can push it into a registry. Um, we'll give that, we'll give that a second. And then once it's pushed into a registry, then we can, then the question comes, all right, and how do I deploy this thing? Uh, so we built it and we have it. Let's go over here. Let's uh, make sure that, let me just make sure this is work, gonna work. And then let's pop into this other, let's delete that, pop into this other demo. And what we're gonna see is if we make a call between a pod and the review service, we get, we get a certain behavior, the out of the box behavior, we get the response that looks good. But what we wanna do is install a WebAssembly module to change the behavior, in this case, simple demo of the, the response headers, right? What we're gonna do is we're gonna define using, using some configuration where to apply this change, where this extension extensibility, where, it, where this extension should exist, and what module we want to we want to use, and and pull it from a particular repo. And so, if we take this same this declarative model here and say, all right, we're going to apply this to reviews v two, that happens to run on cluster one, and apply it to our config automation server management server, um, then we should cross our fingers. If we get the deployment itself, we should see a status. All right, it's been deployed. And now if we try to call reviews, might take a couple of tries because we applied it to reviews v2 uh, and it's gonna load balance between the two. So let's just try a couple more times. Uh, more times if it doesn't break. Okay, then we see we do get the the extension. We do get this this uh, this change in uh, in behavior uh, through through WebAssembly. And so we can do that. We did this. We specified cluster one, but we could have specified any of the cluster, all of the clusters. Um, and in th the way this is working is the WebAssembly module. So it wasn't baked into the image or anything like that. Uh, we dynamically loaded it at, at runtime and actually streamed the module over a, a, a secondary XDS channel that uh, was then able to dynamically load into the proxy and obviously here change the behavior of, of the proxy. Um, and I, I guess if we look back at the UI, you can see that there's, uh, um, you know, this, is, this is something that we added to the particular workloads and that uh, it's showing showing that it was installed uh, nicely. All right, so uh, I was I was hoping to come on and uh, see whether or not the iPad illustrations would work and share a couple of things that we've been working with our users, our customers here at Solo and uh, and then show you what we're doing around WebAssembly and how that integrates with, with Istio. Um, but yeah, I, I won't take any more of your time and uh, I'll leave it open for questions. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, I know that we got a start and we got on a late start, so we may not have time for going to breakout rooms, but uh, maybe we can have a conversation about this uh, demo. And if you have questions or comments, uh, please feel free to speak up, but if that's not an option for you, we can also read the chat. Yep. 
Sounds good. Christian, you mentioned heterogeneous clusters. Are you using this model across multiple versions of Istio within one mesh? So the, the, the architecture of the configuration service uh, allows that. We haven't gotten to, uh, we have users who are about to run into that and we will support it. Um, but so far everybody's uh, been on the same version of, of Istio. But this, this absolutely is intended to be used across any versions of Istio um, and, uh, you know, and potentially even other meshes. But uh, that, that's, that is the intent to support that use case. I ask because I'm interested in feedback. Like, like if you, do you ever have a scenario where say one cluster is having problem with some particular action that you've taken, but others are doing just fine? And if so, what does the feedback loop look like? Yeah, right now. And, and so when you, when you say having some problem, are you, having, are you saying some problem after we've applied some config or um, sure. after just, just because it's having some problem? Uh, after applying config is probably the most interesting scenario. Right. Um, and so the, the, the approach we have for, for that is to, um, ahead of time, you can, config, you can configure, right? If you say, apply this, apply this config, and it doesn't apply successfully to all of the clusters, then, then roll it back. Uh, or you can configure it by default to go ahead and apply it. Uh, and then if one of them doesn't, um, if, if it, one of them doesn't work out the way you're expecting, then at least notify the user uh, and then give enough debugging tools to go, go help figure out why. Um, so that's, that's kind of where we are right, right now. So either, either roll back or fail forward and you know, give, give supporting tools. That's great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other, any other questions? I appreciate you all staying and, and asking. All right, well then, uh, you know, happy to, to uh, have any folks. Let me see if I can get this back. A, a quick one. So I've seen a video about, a, it was like a two, three minute video about Easter 1.9. And there was a very vague mention about a global registry that it will work aligned with Kubernetes multi-cluster support. Uh, are you familiar with those changes that are coming down the line? Will that somehow conflict with the work that you're doing here? Um, I personally have not. Uh, sounds like it would, uh, it wouldn't conflict. It would make it easier for us, <laughs> right. um, but, um, no, I haven't, I haven't seen that yet. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Is that somebody, anybody on the working groups, Mitch or, or Lynn or whomever else we have here? Uh, care to, I care think to that would be the environment's attention. working group. And I don't see anyone okay. here at the moment, unless I've missed someone. Okay. Yeah, I, I I don't think it's going to be in one nine. I mean, there are vaguely some discussion around it, but I don't recall being placed into one nine. I've got one. This is Derek from Zendesk. Um, a lot of the Istio multi-cluster stuff we've seen kind of anticipates a model where you'll be load balancing um, requests for the same service across many clusters. Um, our architecture is such that each cluster is its own shard and they run the same copies of the same services, but we don't want to load balance across. So would it be able to, would you be able to like address remote instances of service services uh, deliberately and explicitly without having to, you know, you make a request to service B in cluster two that won't go to cluster three or four? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, and so with, with, with the model, at least we have within GlueMesh, the services in different clusters will be uniquely identified as being in those clusters. So you can route specifically to those. 
or if you want to group them, if there's other ways that you want to group them, you can you can specify a global name and and have them grouped to either one cluster or two clusters or whatever. Um, but you can, so if they would be sharded across and they're not uh, heterogeneous, they're just you know they're in their own cluster, uh, then you would be able to uh, you would be able to directly ad address them. And Great. just to answer your question, uh, in Istio, there is also something called locality load balancer. So this is something enabled by default, but uh, it's only enabled when you also configure outlier detection inside of your destination rule. So if you have destination rule uh, with 